Greetings, friends. Last week we looked at two words that sum up the Christian life, come and go. We learned that after coming to Christ for salvation, every believer has the duty to go and share his experience with those around him. Jesus famously mandated this in his Great Commission, the commission to make disciples of all nations. But he also modeled it in his own life in ministry. He did so perfectly. So if you need help in obeying the command, studying Jesus' life in the Gospels will help you learn from the best. One of the accounts from his ministry is found in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26, and that's the text that I've chosen for our time in the Word together today. Let's pray, and then we'll start our study. Thank you, Father God, for an opportunity once again to come before you in Jesus' name with our word, your word, our Bibles opened in front of us with our hearts um, expectant for truth and a desire to serve you. Father, help us today to become more like you, to understand what you're calling us to do, to appreciate the power you've given us to do it, and Father God, just to get out and do it, to share our faith and to be uh, faithful in this way as you've told us to be. And I pray, Father God, for insights to be learned. And as I said, passion to be generated in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first we see a witnessing tale, and that's what John chapter 4 is. There are other things that we could take from the text. There's many uh, ways you could go with this. But the woman at the well is a familiar story to most of us, and it has to do with uh, an example of our Lord's personal evangelism method. The setting is found in verses 1 through 6. So if you have your Bibles and you're at the Gospel of John chapter 4, I'd invite you to join me as I read the first six verses, the background, the setting of the story. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. John is the only gospel that tells us of the baptizing ministry of Jesus. In the first chapter of his book, we learned that the Pharisees in Jerusalem had sent men to check out John the Baptist's credentials. In chapter 1, 19 said, uh, Now this is a testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And so, as his popularity among the masses was perceived as a threat to their own authority, they came to check him out. Now that Christ's ministry has overtaken John's, as we just read, right, in, in numbers of people coming and listening to his teaching and, and, and being baptized, they turn their attention on Jesus. But you see, it's not yet God's timing for a full revelation of the Messiah. So Jesus avoids controversy by departing Judea and heading north to Galilee. Now to get there, verse 4 says, he needed to go through Samaria. This seemingly innocuous statement would actually be quite problematic for the Jews of the day. You see, Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. In fact, they loathed them. They despised them. There were social, cultural, and religious prejudices at work here. So because Jews considered Samaritans unclean, they wouldn't defile themselves by crossing the border into their land or by touching anything handed to them by a Samaritan, or even to speaking to them or acknowledging their presence. Now that presented a problem if you were traveling from Judea to Galilee, as Jesus had decided to do, because Samaria is smack dab in the middle of these two Jewish territories. There's Judea, and there's Galilee in the north, and then there's Samaria in the middle. So he this going through Samaria, it, you had to do it. Now there was a, a physical way to get around it, and the Jews kind of in their snobbishness, snobbery, would take a long circuit route around so they wouldn't have to defile themselves, as I said. But I don't think this is talking geographically. I think it's talking evangelistically. Jesus had to go through Samaria, not because it was the next thing on the map, but because it was the place where God wanted him to go. He had, 
Jesus had a divine appointment in Samaria. He was going there by divine obligation and direction. So, leaving at six in the morning and walking six hours with his disciples in tow, the Savior arrives at Sychar, at the ancient Jacob's well. Now, that's, that well was still productive after 1,800 years of service. Sending the disciples away for provisions, which we see in verse 8 says the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Jesus, displaying his full humanity, is worn out from the exertion of the trip, and he takes a seat there at the edge of the well. And that's the setting for this witnessing tale. That sets us up for everything that we will see today and the application that we will make to our own lives. That's the setting. Here's the story itself. The action begins in verses 7 and 8. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples, as I said, had gone away into the town to buy food and to get provisions. Now, the community women who drew water from the well, and it's interesting, it was always women, um, these women typically came when the temperature was cooler in early morning or um, in the evening. But the appearance of this particular woman is no surprise to Jesus. She shouldn't have been there. She wouldn't have been there except for things going on that we'll deal with in a moment. But Jesus isn't surprised. He's been expecting her. She's the reason he came, for goodness sakes. He, he is seeking her. And because he's working according to God's program, the limitations others try to put on him fall flat. Now, it doesn't mean they don't try to still limit us. What we see here is that society will try to deter us from witnessing. They will try to keep us from reaching out. Now, there's different ways that they do that. To deter speaks of discouraging somebody from doing something by instilling fear of the consequences. So, in the culture of the day, Jesus shouldn't even be here, as we've discussed. A good Jewish man would have taken that long route to avoid this area entirely. He certainly wouldn't be talking to a woman because of their place in society. And a Samaritan woman at that, and to make it even worse, this was a woman who was uh, unknown to him. By the way, in the Jewish tradition, if you talked, if a man talked to a woman that he didn't know, um, then it was considered flirtatious and, um, and improper. On top of that, this was a very immoral woman, known by everybody in the community as such. Um, and so all these things tell us that Jesus is breaking all the rules. This is something that the religious leaders wouldn't, wouldn't appreciate, the, the social people. All of them would have a problem with it. But the thing is, the society always tries to keep us from doing what we should do as Christians. There are, there are things that are... Uh, prohibited by them, but aren't prohibited morally or scripturally. We need to make sure that we don't allow the world or some societal norm or some cultural um, you know, strangeness to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. If Jesus followed the culture and followed the norms of the religion, that, that the Jewish religion, he wouldn't have been here. And this lady wouldn't have heard the gospel. But that's not what he would do. He was here speaking. Now, it, it was so unusual that when the disciples came back in verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. So they were amazed because it just didn't happen this way. Now, the, the lady knows that as well. She knows the rules. So in verse 9, she says this. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, Ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus was doing this because he was not following the dictates of society or the opinion of men. In fact, later in verse 34, he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus, my friends, is operating on kingdom principles. And that's what you and I need to do as well, to not let anything, any bias, any prejudice um, come between us and our responsibility for the Lord. 
Now it's interesting, but not surprising, this is why Christ came, that the, the, the words give and gift are found six times in the next section, verses 10 through 15. But it's interesting to me that in the 10th verse, um, the woman has just says, uh, what are you, why are you talking to me? And I it, it didn't expect it, and Jesus responds. But what Jesus does in verse 10 is to entirely ignore the woman's question. She's focusing on the externals. He's more interested in what happens on the inside. She's talking about the physical. He's bringing the spiritual. He doesn't want another tired discussion of the petty differences between religious groups. And so here's verse 10. Notice he's not answering her question at all. Um, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink for me, a Samaritan? Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The Lord is taking control of the conversation. He is not going to allow this already to, be, to go off the rails. The woman at the well, he said, has a twofold problem. And this is important because it's the same problem every unbeliever has today, folks. She doesn't know about God's gift, and she doesn't know about Jesus' true identity. It says it right there. If you knew the gift of God, so she doesn't, obviously. If you knew who I am, and she doesn't, then she, she says you would have asked, and I would give you living water. Because he's the only one that can provide that. So today as well, people don't know about God's gift. They don't understand it. They don't know who Jesus is. And so it's the same problem. And we need to keep in mind that there are things that we know to be true as Christians in the spiritual realm that the world at large just doesn't get at all. That's because of something Paul wrote in Corinthians. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So this woman is not able to understand showing to us, and she proves it further, further in a minute, that she is not saved, that she is in need, and that the Lord has come to the right place. And he really is masterfully brings her to a fuller understanding. So I want to read verses 11 to 15. The story continues. So he talks about, if you knew this, if you knew these two things, you would ask me for a living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Again, she's on a physical plane only. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw ever again, is the idea there. Six times, give, gift, give, gift. And he's talking to her about what she really needs. She's clueless about that. But we see she's moving forward, and the Lord is directing her uh, to himself. So her immediate need is water. That's why, we're, that's why she, you go to a well, after all, right? Jesus uses this keenly felt need to awaken in her heart a desire for the kind of water that will spring up like a fountain, providing everlasting life. This is the gospel. This is exactly the message of, of, of the church today that you need to have everlasting life, and that comes through Christ. This would quench her spiritual thirst, her real thirst forever. Later in John chapter 7, it's interesting that Jesus unveils to another group what this living water is, uh, 737 to 39. Let me just turn there with me if, you, if you'd like. I'll read for you chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. There's the same reference. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So when he's talking about that 
the river of life flowing out, that fountain that gives uh, living water unto eternity, uh, that is the Holy Spirit of God who will live in, who does live inside um, the spirit of those who are trusting in Christ. Now, she doesn't know this yet. In John chapter 4, she's taking baby steps. Society's rules, society's cultural prejudices can keep us from sharing our faith, and they must be overruled by God's command, Christ's example, and our love for the lost. But when we do as we should and begin to witness, there's another thing to watch out for. And every soul winner has found this to be the case. Along with society trying to deter us from witnessing, the person we're talking to will try to distract us from witnessing. Mark it down. At some time, probably in every conversation, as we're talking about the Lord and maybe getting closer to the things, the, the deeper things, that person will ask us a, a question that's just out of the blue. Um, it's, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about quite often. Um, it's an attempt to divert attention. Maybe they're feeling the gospel heat of the Holy Spirit convicting them. But we see that she, um, the Lord moves beyond pleasantries and the initial mention of what God offers, and he says something that needs to be said, that none of us deserves this living water, that it is a gift of grace, and that the reason, listen, the reason we don't have living water, like, automatically, is because of our sin. It's a self-inflicted problem. The spiritual barrenness of every person without Christ, man, woman, boy, girl, that that is something that comes from our own sinful nature, and so the living water is not something that we deserve, something that we can work for. It must be received as a gift. This unsaved woman needs more than physical water. She needs a savior. She is living in sinful rebellion against God. And though the person that you and I are speaking with in our daily opportunities to witness probably doesn't have the same record this lady does or even the same sin, they still have a problem because all of us are sinners. So that's why repentance, which is a change of mind that leads to a change in life, is required for salvation. This is not easy believism. This is not pray this prayer and walk this aisle. There's a commitment to Christ that must be made. Salvation is free, but it wasn't cheap. Christ gave his life, shed his blood for us, and we need to have a commitment to follow him. So the problem is the lady has sin in her life and Jesus, the, the, the Savior at the well, talks to the woman at the well with a, it convicts her, if you will, with a simple but direct question, go call, or statement, go call your husband. We read about this exchange next in verses 16 to 20. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Do you see what she's doing there? She's trying to distract. Um, that, that response, I have no husband, is designed to cut off further conversation along this line. It's vague. It's ambiguous. She's not telling the whole story. She wants to retain some privacy and some semblance of respectability. But it's not going to happen because it's, it's because of her sin that Jesus has come in the first place. You see, this lady's life is an absolute mess. She's not just immoral. She's messed up royally. As Jesus knows through divine omniscience, she's had a whole series of false beginnings and shattered hopes and broken relationships with five men previously currently living in sin with number six. The woman is a serial fornicator. When he points that out, and he, he shouldn't have known, right? She assumes he's a prophet. And wilting under the knowledge of her now revealed sin, she quickly, look at, she quickly pivots to a safer topic, the topic of religion. This is nothing else than a diversionary practice that is well known, as I said, to every soul winner. She wants to 
solve a centuries-old dispute between Jews and Samaritans regarding the proper place to worship, hoping that this guy will get distracted from his earlier line of questioning and talk about, well, anything else about her guilt. So as he hones in, zeroes in on the problem and talks about her sin to point out her need, because until you know your need, you won't accept the solution. He's pointing out her need, the, the larger need than physical water. And she says, you know, oh, look, look over here, look at that. And look at that shiny thing in the corner because she doesn't want to talk about this. And this happens a lot. Jesus, being Jesus, again chooses to disregard what she brings up and because a time is soon coming when the whole question will be moot. He's not going to get into a petty discussion between two different religions because spiritually speaking, after he is crucified and resurrected, he will become the substitute for both Jerusalem and Mount Gerizim. It's not going to matter. He says, let's move on the irrelevancies and let's move on to what really matters. That's for her good, folks, whether she knows it or not. Back in, in chapter 2, just a page back, John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus had said this. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now he's right at the gorgeous uh, temple in Jerusalem. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So let's get into the text in, in John 4 again. Here's 21 to 24, uh, chapter 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. True worship, he says, is always in spirit and truth. Not worship, this is so important, it's not worship in a particular place. It's worshiping a particular place person. Jesus says, I am the one to be worshipped. And in the book of Revelation, at the end, um, all glory and worship and honor is given to God, right? And so Jesus has effectively shared the truth of salvation with a needy, unbelieving lady. It's been on her turf, but it's been on his terms. And it's an excellent story, an excellent true story, a tale of witnessing to provide us some tips for witnessing because we need to go and do likewise. We need to do what Jesus did and he's given us the path. He's given us the pattern right here. So here's a few things that I would suggest to you as principles and they're things that I have found to be effective in my own soul winning ministry. First of all, we should see each contact as a divine appointment, as a divine appointment. You know, one of the most exciting things about the Christian life is the knowledge that God has already laid out a plan for us and is actively directing circumstances and people and resources for us to fulfill that plan in everyday experience. What joy comes to our hearts when we realize that we don't live by chance. We're not knocking on wood. We don't need rabbit's feet. We don't need luck or chance. We don't have serendipity. We have sovereignty. We have God's plan for us. That means every time you bump into someone, know please that God has sent them for a divine purpose and ask him, Lord, what do you have for me to do with this new opportunity? So we need to understand that when we come and are serving the Lord, each contact is a divine appointment. It's not an accident. No such thing as accidents. Not for a Christian. Secondly, when meeting someone for the first time, one of these contacts, we should make a divine assumption. Jesus, because of his omniscience, knew all about the woman in this story without needing to ask. We don't have that luxury, of course. And although making assumptions can be dangerous, and most people say we shouldn't do it, and I would that's often true. Listen, when it comes to meeting a new person, I found it always better to assume that they need Jesus than to assume that they don't. 
I mean, a lot of people, I think, go the other way. They meet someone, I guess they just assume they're going to heaven. But what if they're not? What if God has sent them to you in order to share the gospel, and, and you, you don't take the opportunity because you made the, the wrong assumption? So I think it's divine. Yeah, I think it's okay. I think it's helpful for us inwardly, right? You don't tell them that. But to have, in my own heart, if it's a new person, a new person comes through the doors in church, uh, I, I just assume I need to share the gospel. And that's an assumption that I think helps keep me on my toes. If a person isn't saved, I may have an opportunity. And if they are saved, they won't be offended that I wanted to be sure. Again, God's in control of all this, folks, but be alert. Brother, be alert, sister. When meeting someone for the first time, make a divine assumption. See that contact as a divine appointment. And then throughout the encounter, pray for divine acute astuteness. astuteness. We need discernment to know the need and skill to direct the conversation to redemptive ends. Now, our interest in the person must be genuine and must be warm. They're not an assignment. No, of course not. They're a, a, a person made in the image of God and the soul for whom Christ died. And he wants them to come to know him, and we want that as well. But we should be looking for chances to advance the kingdom as we talk. When a question is raised or a challenge is given, we should immediately offer what I call an arrow prayer to God. You know, isn't it cool that we can pray? I, I can be talking or listening and still praying with my heart and with my spirit. And so we should ask God help. What can I say? I have found this to be so helpful, friends. I'm talking to somebody, they ask a legitimate question. It's a question that I feel I need to answer. Some we don't, but some, some are, I, I see them moving in a direction. And I ask Lord, I ask the Lord, help me, give me wisdom, help me to say what this person needs to hear, because I don't know what's in their heart, I don't know what's in their mind, but you do, Lord. And so all that happens while I'm sitting there listening, I'm asking God, remind me of a verse, Lord. Help me to find the best way to put this, Lord. And I'm asking for wisdom and for insight and for skill, skill beyond my own ability. Because talking to God about man is always the best way to start and to follow through when you talk to man about God. Talk to God about man and then talk to man about God. So throughout the encounter, before certainly, during and after, pray, ask God for his wisdom, his astuteness from on high. The fourth thing I would say is when sharing our faith, we should have divine audacity. Now, audacious can have kind of a bad connotation as well, right? I'm not talking recklessness or boorishness. But I'm talking about a holy boldness that ensures we are able to get the most important message in the world out. Don't let things keep you from sharing. If God's telling you to say it, say it. If God's telling you to share it, share it. Don't let anything going on around you. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything detour you. Make sure that you are audacious, bold for God. We show holy boldness by initiating the contact rather than waiting for someone to come to us. Jesus arrived at the well first. Jesus spoke to the lady first. He took it upon himself. He was willing and he was able and he was going after the prize. Now, Christians like to talk about those who are seekers, but my Bible says that Jesus is the seeker. Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Unbelievers aren't seekers. Until God starts to work in their heart, the Bible says there's none that understands, there's none that seeks after God, Romans 3, 10, and 11. And so, the seeker in the situation is Jesus. And because we work for him, brother and sister, we are to seek others. Look for opportunities. Don't sit back there afraid someone's going to ask you and hoping they don't secretly, but rather with confidence and boldness in the name of Jesus and the Spirit who indwells you in the Word of God that is the sword of the Spirit. Look for opportunities. Begin a conversation. Make that contact. Secondly, we show holy boldness by controlling the conversation. And that's what Jesus did as we saw. Jesus was always in charge. He directed the woman toward the end that God had designed. He didn't allow himself to be distracted by political or religious issues, but he stayed on target from start to finish. He wasn't rude. He didn't raise his voice. He acknowledged her. He respected her. 
but he didn't let her hijack the conversation. We need, to, we need to understand, folks, that we don't have to answer every question or respond to every criticism from Christianity's 2,000-year history. And so, translations of the Bible, so-called contradictions in the Bible, or, or so-and-so says they're a Christian and they live like this, move, move away from that. Don't take that bait. Control the conversation. Bring it to Jesus. And that's the third one. We show holy boldness by constantly bringing discussion back to Christ. When she finally mentioned the Messiah here, the Lord um, wasted no time self-identifying, giving her information that few had so far received so openly in his, in his ministry. Remember, early on, he said, uh, he'd say different times, don't tell people who I am, because the time wasn't right. But here, in verses 25 and 26, what love he had for this woman. What grace to, to say to her, I'm, I'm the Lord, I'm the one, I'm your, I'm your hope. Here it is, verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I am. It's me. I'm the one that you're looking for. And the goal of every witnessing opportunity for us is to introduce people to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am he. We say, he is the Savior. He is the Lord. He is the one you need, the one that is looking for you, and the one that you um, have been brought to look for him as well. So as a genuine believer, you're already going to share your faith. I'm going to, I'm going to take that as, as a, as a rock-solid belief. How can you keep silent, considering all that God has done for you, knowing that he's commanded you? So I'm going to, I'm going to assume, okay, I'm going to assume that you are already going to share your faith. So why not learn from the best as you prepare for that adventure each and every day? Pray for opportunities when the day starts. Look for opportunities. Read the scripture. Be in prayer. Be in the word. Walk in the spirit. That's why you, that's why you were left here, brother and sister. Don't just live life like everybody else. That's boring. and It doesn't fulfill the adventure faith adventure that God has placed you in when he saved you from your sins. And so get ready, prepare, do what God has told us to do. It is my heartfelt prayer and desire that this witnessing tale and these witnessing tips would help you become a soul winner for Jesus Christ because Proverbs 11.30 says, He who wins souls is wise. Here's praying that you will be wise this week, my friend. And we'll see you again next time.